we're meeting, as you know, 35% um, of Canada's energy needs. We're the fastest growing energy end use in the country. Um, yeah. We're the most affordable. We've got industrial, commercial, residential customers coming to us all the time, asking us how to get how to get natural gas if they don't get it already. We've got you know some of your colleagues in the on the back bench saying to us, "What do we do to get gas into our ridings if we don't already yeah. have it?" So it's it, and that's the general context. It's a great place to be in the in the context of COVID. Our response is okay. You know what's best for us to do to help generate that economic recovery quickly. And I think that's what applies today as much as it does in October. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? You know, what, what do you recommend to us in the, in the downstream gas industry to, to help with the recovery? Um, I think, I mean, a few things that we know, by the way, I apologize for the noise in the background, but they decided to start construction on a new uh, sidewalk on my street just in time for this interview. This, this is what it is to be. The great, uh, the great thing home. about COVID is that dogs go past, children run by, construction occurs. You see the dogs are good. Here. I can't deal. I you know I have you know the dogs will obey me for the most part and will work for treats. Uh, the construction guys across the street not so much. Um, I think you know the mo the most the most important thing. Uh, the my most important message I think as we go through this period of transition and I think you know. One of the things we've seen with COVID is it seems to be um, in, in the business world and in the political world really accelerating trends and exacerbating differences and inequities. Um, so it's causing all of us, I think, to, uh, you know, both in the energy industry and, and in, in large and more largely in society to confront things much more quickly than we thought we would have to. Um, there are some things that don't change. Uh, there will be no economic recovery without uh, our oil and gas sector. Um, and that is a point that I was making in February, and it's a point I make with even more uh, vigor now. Um, we are the fourth largest producer of gas in the world. Uh, we are the sixth largest exporter of natural gas. This is, you know, energy is our family business. It's what we do. Uh, it supports hundreds of thousands of jobs in this country. Um, and it is an, ex an export that's poised for more growth. Uh, you know, we got, what, $6.1 billion in exports in 2018. Uh, we're poised to become one of the world's cleanest producers, uh, supplying both domestic and global markets for natural gas. And it provides affordable power and heat to communities right across our country. So we need this industry. Uh, to power our economy, and we need our economy powered in order to lower our emissions and 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 do the things that we know that that we will need to do for the future. Um, you 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 don't uh, you don't transition an economy by pulling the plug out on it. You know, um, we have to be methodical about this, and and but we understand the urgency of it, um, and it's an urgency. You know, we'll talk about it perhaps. Um, throughout this interview, but it's, it's, it's an urgency that is not only um, just about the climate anymore or combating climate change, it is where investments are going. It is how things are moving. Um, you know, I don't, uh, I, I get my information on renewables increasingly, not from renewables trades magazines, but from the Economist and the Financial Times. This is going mainstream business now. This year is the first year that investments in renewables are beating up non-renewables. So, and one thing that I know is that is that you know natural gas particularly is going to be an essential part of the mix. Um, I do a lot. I've spent a lot of time with um, uh, Fatih Birol and the International Energy Agency. Uh, you just have to travel to Paris in order to to attend those meetings, which I'm told was a very nice thing to be able to do. But because I'm a recent minister and mainly under COVID, I've not, not been to Paris. But we zoom all the time. Um, and they're forecasting that that natural gas will, you know, the global demand is going to continue to grow for decades to come, even as those renewable sources of energy increase their market shares. So you know, gas is in a prime position to lead the clean energy transformation. You got, uh, you know, clean tech investments coming from the oil and gas sector of about a billion dollars a year in this country. You know, that's 75 percent of the total coming from oil. Um, uh, per barrel emission reductions, 30% over, over the past 20 years. We know we got to do better, but that is considerable. 
And, and that's thanks in part to the electrification of natural gas production, uh, which we've seen and, and which we want, we want to increase, uh, you know, as well as uh, liquefied natural gas products on the West Coast. And, and I think there's similar potential for the East Coast. Um, I was reading the Financial Times uh, a couple of weeks ago, and you know, it was like I said, increasingly you're seeing these articles and these editorials coming from them, and, and you know, FT obviously very pro business uh, periodical, um, but they said resisting the pathway towards renewables has been recognized as both futile and bad business. Um, so you know, for anybody in the energy market, um, you know, it's something you got to look at. It's something you have to take into account. Um, and, you know, natural, gra natural gas is poised to do that. I think, I think we, you know, as a, as a major player, but also a smart player, um, you know, we, we can foresee the products that people need. We see where investment is going and we know how to follow the money. And, um, you know, what I remember when I was, uh, uh, at Globe, um, at the, you know, the clean tech conference of Vancouver, largest in North America. And I, and I said that to them, I said, look, we're the, you know, six biggest producers of, of, of natural gas, fourth of, of oil in the world, uh, we're not reaching net zero without our oil and gas sector in this country. We're, we're not reaching. Uh, the oil and the road to net zero in Canada goes through Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland and Ireland, and BC. And um, the next day, as it just happened by coincidence, I was co-hosting an innovation summit in, uh, in Calgary with Sonny Savage. And, and, you know, it was then that the decision on BlackRock had come down. And, you know, you, since then we've seen Deutsche Bank and other players. And it was kind of hitting them that this is where, you know, the, uh, Canada's energy industry was, was in some people's crosshairs. Um, and, and my answer to them was, you know, a prosperous natural gas sector, a natural prosperous oil and gas sector in Canada uh, needs net zero. And, and my message was, it's not, it's not about just the environment anymore and the noble cause of combating co climate change. It is a noble cause. Um, it, this has become a strategic economic imperative. This has become a competitiveness com imperative for our country because it's where the money's going. And uh, my, our great concern is that, um, you know, for, for money managers around the world and for investors, whether they, you know, whether in New York or London or Zurich, um, you know, they look for boxes to check. Um, you know, and, and the, and the picture I paint is, is a you know, money manager, a portfolio manager sitting on the end of the boardroom table and looking down at his juniors and saying, what are we doing about climate change? And they just, one puts up his hand and says, uh, we're not investing in Canadian energy. Box to check. That, that is dangerous and that cannot happen and it is happening. So we have to combat that. And I said, look, you know, on the other side of the ledger, the box to check in terms of is this jurisdiction doing something about climate change is becoming net zero. Mm -hmm. They're looking for jurisdictions that are committed to net zero by net zero emissions by 2050. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm here in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, a month and a half ago, the legislature here unanimously uh, passed a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050. And, you know, we are, uh, one of the three, uh, major oil and gas producing provinces in the country. So that was a big deal. And, and, you know, they see which way things are going and, and, and they're moving. That's, and that's what we got to do. Now, Minister, you called it yourself a moonshot. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's, an, it's an aggressive target um, that your government set. And I take your point that there are, there are other players who are calling for it. Um, and yet you consistently, as you just have, you, you, you make the point that the oil and gas sector, you got to be working with them uh, to pursue any targets that you do set. But there are lots who are keen on those targets who say that they cannot be pursued with this sector. And I'd say, frankly, there are lots who are, who are supporters of, of yours and your government's views. What, what do you say to them um, when they say, you know, when they're looking at passing municipal bans on natural gas or doing other things like that? Like, what's, your, what's your response to them? Um. I'm, I'm here on a, on a very nice day, actually, 25 degrees and sunny, which doesn't happen very often here in St. John's. I am, I am, you know, zooming to you from the furthest eastern point of North America, uh, a rock literally in the middle of the North Atlantic. Uh, I grew up here and I grew up in a, in a community in Labrador, a fly-in, fly-out community in the north. Um, you grow up in a community like this, uh, you don't have time, you can't afford idealism. I deal with the world, people here deal with the world as it is. 
And the fact of the matter is we are the fourth biggest producer of oil in the world. We are, we are a major producer of natural gas. Um, on the flip side of the ledger, we're the second biggest hydroelectric producers in the world too. Um, uh, we're tier one nuclear. We've got a mix here, but the point being that, you know, there are too many people, unfortunately, in this country who don't have the proximity that I do, right. or people, let's say, in Alberta and Saskatchewan do, to the number one wealth creator in this country. Uh, if I cross the street and look out at the harbor in St. John's, I see supply ships going out to those, to those rigs all the time. I'm reminded of it every day. This is real. And, and what I say to those people um, who you point out, you know, say that, you know, we just, you, you got to just turn it all off. Um, uh, I say that's not dealing with reality. I'm ambitious. Um, I'm, I'm an environmentalist. Um, I believe in lowering emissions. I believe in net zero by 2050. And because I'm, I believe in it and I'm real about it, this is reality. This is what change looks like. It's making tough decisions. You can't indulge in just, you know, snappy speeches anymore that says we're, ter- we're saying no to that and yes to this. Nope, that's not how we get there. And it is particularly not how you get there in a democracy. Um, you know, you... You, you grow up in a, in, in a marginal province, and then I spent, you know, I grew up in Labrador too, which is like the, you know, the, the margin of the margin. Um, and government is sometimes a faraway thing that is not in keeping with the reality as you see it on the ground, right? Um, you don't feel included. Labrador, for instance, does, you know, for years, some still don't, doesn't feel part of this province. St. John's is like the other. Similarly, this province doesn't always feel it's represented in Ottawa feels like you know it's it, it's not heard uh if we do not include people in this in, in in lowering emissions um it will not happen because they will choose another government that will include them where they do feel included and and that government may be you know either represent the status quo or maybe not be as ambitious as we as we are or worse we'll we'll pull things back as we've seen in the united states uh, you know, in, in, in the Trump administration, when you look at the climate, at the climate goals that the Obama administration put, but that is the fact of, of a democracy. So people need to feel included in this change. I don't even like saying transition, I, because frankly, look, especially COVID right now, people were dealing with enough change in the economy and enough churn, particularly in this industry. Uh, with COVID, the last thing that they want to hear is about more change or transition. Yeah. I keep my eye on the prize, which is lowering emissions. And how do we, how do we, how do we do that? And, you know, we, uh, you know, we were able to do, one of the ways we were able to do it during um, uh, COVID very early on was, was to build on something that we were already working on, which was in an active and orphan wells. And that has, uh, you know, that kind of hit the sweet spot. There's not very often in politics particularly, you know, as you point out the question, such a divisive debate about energy and energy, our energy future in this country. But when you have Premier Kenny and Elizabeth May both agreeing with you, you're on to something. And, and, that, and, I, and that's where we were with an active and orphan wealth. Um, it was something that we had been working on with the governments of Alberta and Saskatchewan and BC for some time. Um, you know, we put $1.7 billion to it. Um, and and uh, it will, it will, it will, it's good work that needs to be done and will employ tens of thousands of, of good workers with the experience and talent and skill, the people that we need, people who we need to make sure, you know, are, 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 are doing good work uh, until, you know, kind of everything starts to write itself. In some spaces, it's already starting to write itself. But, but you know, I think, you know, that's, 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 so that's what we've got to do. Um, we've got to be, you know, the, the three things I keep repeating is that we've got to be smart, in that we've got to, you know, we've got to use that ingenuity, frankly, that we used in order to, to get oil out of stand in the oil sands, for instance. You know, that is remarkable. That took, that took, that was an incredible feat. And suddenly we find ourselves here, you know, a top five energy player in the world. Yeah. You know, when I do those Zooms, by the way, with the IEA and, and the World Economic Forum and the G20, we've all learned now that on, on large Zoom calls, there's a hierarchy. Did you make the first screen? Yeah. You know, in a gallery view. Sure. And I keep, I kept making the first screen. I thought I was particularly engaging. It's not. <laughs> it's because I'm the Minister of Natural Resources for Canada. Right. right. And, and everybody is looking at us for those reasons. 
So, you know, we've got to be, I'm very proud of where we are. I'm very proud of what we've been able to do. I'm very proud of the fact that we're, you know, such a large player in gas and, and in oil. Um, what, you know, my argument now is, okay, that ingenuity that we had before to get to where we are, we've got to use that as well now in order to lower our emissions. Yeah. And I'm doing, because we did this, then I think we can do that. I really do. We need, we need to be very thorough as well. We can't overlook stuff. And I think one of the biggest things we overlook really, and I'm very hot on this, and it comes back to my message on inclusivity, is, is uh, e efficiencies, Res like home, at home efficiencies, like re retrofitting your home, retrofitting buildings, new building codes. Uh, that, that is our actually, that's, a, that's our, 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 our almost our first fuel as we're looking at, at fuels that we can use is, is the efficiencies. Um, we can reach one third to one quarter, or one quarter to one third of our, of our Paris Accord um, targets through three efficiencies, uh, which is remarkable. And then I think, you know, as I said before, we've got to be thoughtful. We've got to make sure people are included. Um, and look, we've been doing good work here on ESG. We're ranked at the top with Yale. Um, a lot of, I, I, a lot of, uh, you know, we're seeing kind of Europeans, uh, particularly Total, I think most recently, you know, coming out of, of the US. And so a lot of them, I believe, are going by information that just looks at, um, uh, in, in the case of oil, uh, just, it's just looking at emissions per barrel and isn't looking at what we've been able to do to lower those emissions over the past 20 years, which has been remarkable. We need to build on it. But yeah. I think that's where we are. Well, um, I, I share your reservations about the word transition because it, 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 it does suggest, I think, what some of those uh, uh, who are who are keen to stop using fuels altogether uh, want to suggest. And and I would I would actually build on it, Tim, and something that Jonathan Wilkinson actually brought up to me, you know, Minister of Environment and Climate Change, um, is that um, it, it's about it's not about the source of emissions; it's about just lowering emissions. Uh -huh. All right, uh, we got to get out of this targeting certain industries or 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 certain you know thing. We, we just our goal here is just to lower emissions. Yeah. That's yeah. our goal. And on that, not lower their emissions and their emissions, right. their emissions. We just got to lower emissions. Right. And 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 that's a very important point. When, you know, when you when you talk about net zero by twenty fifty, the important word to remember there is net. Uh huh. Right. There will still be emissions, and there will be other things that will offset those inevitable emissions. Right. Yeah. But but you know, we'll still emit. We just got to emit a heck of a lot less in order to reach 2050 and in order to reach the goals we've set for 2030 as well. Right, right. Well, and on that, your your department recently set up a clean fuels branch and, and we were yeah. quite interested in this. Um, we, uh, we started uh, to talk with some of your officials about it because uh, it identifies uh, renewable natural gas and it identifies hydrogen. And we were we were thrilled by that, Minister. You noted electrification earlier, as you no doubt know. Electrification is is uh, at times quite troubling for us uh, if it's suggesting getting off of our fuel and off of our infrastructure. And, and you know, we want to make sure that there's a competitive market, not picking favorites. And your clean fuels branch is has identified renewable natural gas hydrogen priorities, and we love that because we'd say, okay, if you've got these targets. If you can recognize that they can be pursued in a variety of ways, including through gaseous fuels, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about what your thinking is on RNG and hydrogen and where you see them playing in the mix. Going yeah. Forward. Um, well, one of the things we want to do, I think, right off the bat, um, is 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 build on on your natural gas innovation fund. I think that's very important to all of us. Um, you know, and the funding that you're you're helping to supply, uh, it invests in clean tech right across the natural gas supply chain. Uh, I think it's going to be game changing in areas like methane reduction and sustainable production. Um, you know, the help uh, that you're providing producers and distributors uh, to improve environmental performance, to uh, to main to to maintain that competitive edge. I think that we have. Um, we have a strong relationship with you in addressing all of those challenges yep. uh, through uh, through the memorandum of understanding that we have together, and and the creation of the new of the new clean fuels branch, uh, it's it's within my department's low carbon energy sector. It's kind of the next step, I think, in the progression of that of our relationship. Uh, the branch um, builds on our our on other existing work that we have. The national hydrogen strategy uh, out this fall. Uh, our new emissions reduction fund to uh, Environment Canada and, and their development of the clean fuel standard. Um, you know, the idea here, I think, is to specialize but not be myopic. I mean, that's, you know, um, I think you can be both. Uh, you know, the, 
there are, there are, there are certain areas where we know we've really got to drill down. Um, but you know, at the same time, we got to make sure that, that there, everybody's working yeah. together and, uh, yeah. And you, and, and you, you can't do one at, uh, at the expense of the other. Um, you know, as I said, we've got a huge competitive advantage in natural gas. We want to keep it and it will be, you know, integral to lowering emissions broadly, but also the other things that we're doing, whether it be in methane or, or in a clean fuel standard. Uh, we just delve a little bit deeper on, on hydrogen. You, you, you noted the strategy coming out this fall. I know you're in the midst of consultations on it, so I appreciate that you you don't uh, haven't got a, a final view on some aspects of it. But we're we see ourselves as front and center in that strategy because that's about a hydrogen strategy. Fundamentally involves moving a gas through a pipe, and that's what we're really good at. In fact, as you know, um, you know natural gas 100 years years ago had a significant uh, component of hydrogen in it because it was town gas largely derived from coal. So we feel we have a certain history and familiarity with, with hydrogen already. Can you tell us a little bit more about where you want to go with that hydrogen strategy, you know, given that some provinces have already started to speak out on it quite strongly, like, yeah. like Alberta and, and, you know, provinces across the country are looking at it. But any thoughts you want to share on it? Well, we have, a, we have a, a great history in hydrogen dating back about 100 years um, in Canada. Um, and, you know, uh, some of us are old enough, uh, me, uh, I remember driving uh, or riding uh, a hydrogen bus at Expo 86 in Vancouver. Um, and there were a fleet of hydrogen buses as well uh, at the uh, Vancouver Olympics. Um, and, and uh you know, I think it's a, it's a technology that's been waiting for its its moment, um, and I I think that the I think the moment has come, um, and I think that we're well positioned for it. I mean, we have expertise in in batteries, we have expertise in transportation. Um, I was speaking with the Danish ambassador uh, to Canada, and she just brought up the fact that Ballard out of out of BC uh, is powering uh, buses at the University of Copenhagen. And, and companies like Ballard, uh, kind of the top 11 hydrogen companies, the benchmark companies, they've seen an, an increase of 300% in share prices on average over the past year. And, and you know, uh, some of that, if you ask me, you know, what success looks like, I mean, it, it would be obviously a globally competitive industry. It would be, you know, um, uh, vehicles, um, uh, a, a massive increase, particularly in, in, you know, 18 wheelers in transportation. Um, those those uh, those vehicles where uh, you know electrification, for instance, is is not as easy. I mean, for right. smaller cars, for for passenger cars, it's easier. For eighteen wheelers, we're looking at hydrogen, and and you know we, we want to get very aggressive on research and development in steel and in domestic heating as well. Um, Ten years ago, if you looked, for instance, at offshore wind, um, it was you know it, it was impossibly expensive, and I think that ESG has had a big effect on that, and and the trans the transparency that Canada has and the European market has um, has has opened the books, and so uh, you know you're seeing Europe now uh, they want 40 gigawatts of hydrogen power by 2030, and and they're looking at green hydrogen made without fossil fuels, and and they're putting up roughly 40 billion uh, 40 billion euro. Uh, which is, you know, a, a huge amount of money, uh, nine billion from Germany alone. Um, that, I think, frankly, that's good news for Canada. I think it's, it is, it will certainly cause us to be more ambitious, and I think that that's a good thing on hydrogen. Um, it will allow us already. We've got a foothold. Um, I'm sure Ballard is in more places than the University of Copenhagen, and. And, and so, you know, we, it, it gives us, we have a competitive edge here and it, it expands the market. It will expand the demand. Um, you know, as you said, that strategy is coming out in the fall and we're going to keep working with partners like your membership on, on, you know, how, how do we make sure that we've got a solid regulatory framework? I have to say, you know, as much as we give red tape a bad name, Lord knows I've seen it a bad red tape in my day. Um, we do regulatory fairly well. Um, and I'm, I think particularly in, in nuclear, uh, it's actually our competitive edge is the fact that our regulatory is so good and so trusted um, that the world looks up to it. Uh, so uh, you know, we want to we want to do the same thing with hydrogen. Yeah. Um, you you mentioned uh, conversations at the IEA. You mentioned the G20, the the Danish uh, conversations, a host of other international dimensions. I I don't 
turn the conversation a bit to the international. You know, my mm -hmm. side of the gas industry is focused largely on the domestic market, but not exclusively. Several of our members are, are looking at export opportunities or own international assets. One of the big export opportunity, one of my members, Portis BC, is already an LNG exporter and is looking at expanding that. Um, LNG exports present an enormous opportunity for Canada in general. What more do you think we can do as an industry to, to build on that message? Because whereas it, you know, at times the oil and gas industry and your government have, I think there's a common interest and a common vision on the global LNG opportunity that we have. Can you, can you talk a bit about that? Well, yeah, I think it's, you know, uh, 40, 47% of Canada's natural gas is exported. And almost all of that, of course, is to the United States. It's kind of the natural trajectory. Um, and at the same time, natural gas imports from the United States into Eastern Canada has been on the rise. Um, I'm happy that I've got a, a good relationship with the energy secretary in the U.S. Uh, we've, uh, we were introduced and we bonded because of a pandemic. Um, you can imagine early on, we wanted to ensure that, uh, you know, uh, as borders were closing and, and such, and we needed to ensure that, uh, you know, right off the bat, that essential workers in the industry were able to go back and forth. Yeah. You know, you can't take any of this stuff for granted. Yeah. Um, and and in in Secretary Briette, you got a guy who's been, you know, he's been around the block and he understands how the industry works. Uh, he understands uh, how interwoven our economies are, particularly in energy. And so that's been very helpful. Um, uh, but uh, if you look at global forecasts um, for natural gas, natural gas is going to continue to grow in the decades ahead, um, especially as, as economies around the world uh, move to reduce their dependency on more higher emitting fuels, such as coal. Um, and, and this is something that's going to be available to men. You got, of course, you know, $40 billion in the LNG Canada project, largest private sector investment in Canada's history. It's under construction. It's on target. Uh, we'll begin exports to Asia by 2025. Suddenly that's not so far away. Um, uh, you know, proponents of the industry, you know, actively working to advance, I think five or six other uh, LNG projects right across the country. Um, and, you know, my department's looking at several of them. I mean, a lot of those under consideration. Um, electrification of operations in natural gas and LNG production to lower those emissions. Um, you know, uh, we'll lower them by up to 90% below our, our global competitors. I mean, we are going to produce some of the uh, lowest emitting LNG in the world. And, and that's how we'll get to net zero. Um, uh, you know, that's what investors want. And, and you know, we're going to, if you look at things like uh, uh, Alta Gas is Ridley Island uh, propane export terminal, yeah. that's a great example of the potential of diversification as well. Yeah. Yeah. And they're looking at, you know, they're looking at Japan uh, or they're exporting to Japan. I mean, that's that's, you know, that's a great new market for us. So we'll take advantage of our Pacific coast. And I'd like us to take advantage, too, of, uh, you know, of our East Coast as well. Sure. Yeah. And proximity, proximity to the uh, to the European Union market and uh, a market, uh, you know, of, of over 500 million people that is going to demand is, is demanding and it's going to have extremely tight regulations on on lower emitting fuels. Well, um, Minister, good uh, good way to, to, to come around to a, a final question well, for what, but a year and a half or no, a year? For um, me, I've been I've been minister now for uh, what was it, November? Right. So yeah, an an uneventful nine months in global <laughs> uh, in global events, <laughs> and uh, we've seen resource markets turned upside down by all of this. Uh, reflections on the role and on the on the portfolio and and its and its future for uh, uh, for our country. Um, uh, I you know I am definitely somebody who is uh, where he's from. Uh, that's a huge part of of uh, of who I am. And uh, when I was uh, thirteen, um, my my dad got a job in Labrador. We moved up there. And uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay was a fly in fly out community. It was, was also the first time I had ever um, uh, met uh, First Nations people, met in, in, in indigenous people. And, uh, and the neighboring community to Happy Valley Goose Bay, one of the few places you could drive, Sheshashi, uh, I did not know anybody uh, could live in, in, in that way. Yeah. And it, 
uh, the inequity between my community and their community was stark. And it will have, you know, on a kid, it has a huge impact. Um, and uh, it drove what I did. Uh, you know, when I, I did my undergraduate in political science, I did my thesis on, um, on you know, what happens when uh, indigenous people are confronted with development they don't want, uh, how they mobilize against it. Uh, I, I worked as executive assistant to the Minister of Justice. I worked on uh, two uh, land claims tables, we could call them at the time. Um, worked uh, for a year with the uh, with the Premier as his policy advisor, Premier Brian Tobin back then, and uh, continued work at those tables with the Inu and Inuit of Labrador, and worked on an impact benefits agreement uh, for Boise's Bay. Um, went went and did my graduate degree uh, in political science, philosophy, and uh, talked about. Was, uh, uh, did my disser did my dissertation in um, indigenous, indigenous participation in natural resource development. So here I am, you know, uh, I uh, enjoyed a, a, a good 15 year career in, in journalism in between. And now I'm, I'm kind of back to where I began mm -hmm. and to something that I feel very passionately about. Um, one of those people I got to know during that my career in journalism uh, was uh, Jim Prentice and uh, Jim's book, Triple Crown, sits here on my desk. Um, you know, he was, he became a friend of mine. Um, joy, we enjoy talking to another little known fact about Jim is that he was a huge fan of Canadian Idol. And uh, when I was at CTV, that was an occupational hazard for me. I actually I shouldn't call it. I loved, I love watching Canadian Idol too. And he would show up in the audience. So we got to know each other. We'd, he, and he'd come to the Junos. And of course, CTV loved having a prominent minister like Jim Prentice there. And he'd come with his family. And uh, I always enjoyed talking to him. And we had similar passions uh, in, in our energy sector. Uh, coming from energy producing provinces um, in indigenous issues and in justice for indigenous peoples and and uh, uh, and to end the marginalization that they feel and that and, and, and that they live in fact um, and the environment and um, and you know he was a pragmatic guy and a guy who achieved results I had a great deal of time for him and was, his death was an awful thing um, but boy he, you know he stays with me in the book um, and, and, you know, the other thing I think it's really important too, that uh, I felt and really was emboldened by him is the pride that we should feel in what we do, you know, mm -hmm. the pride that we should feel in being one of the great oil producing countries of this world, one of the great natural gas producers of this world, one of the great hydroelectric producers of this world, uh, you know, a tier one nuclear energy producer. Um, and so, you know, I continue with that. And I think... The challenge of our time and what's happened right now with the pandemic is that, you know, not only are, are you seeing, I think, kind of an, uh, an acceleration of trends that we could see happening in the energy industry, um, we're also seeing uh, an exacerbation of the in inequalities that are within our society, but also amongst countries. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'm heartened by is, is what we have seen in this country and how we have handled COVID-19. Um, you know, for the most part, as hard as we are on ourselves, and that seems to be the Canadian way, we've done a pretty good job. And the collective will has been there to look after one another. You know, people make people by putting on a mask, by keeping social distance every day, demonstrate that, that courtesy of, of looking after one another. And so we, we got to move that over, you know, and as, and as, as you know, with that, that, that change, we got to move that over and, and move it over to places like doing what we know we need to do as, as proud, prominent global citizens. Uh, we got to lower our emissions. We got, it's imperative that we do that um, uh, for the sake of our planet and for the sake of future generations. And we got to look after one another within our, own, within our country, uh, the inequities that we see. Most prominently for me, because I grew up in this way, is, is between indigenous and non-indigenous communities. But we also know, you know the Black Lives Matter here uh, movement happened here as well. And for very good reason, and and for uh, racialized people in this country, the inequities are still too great, and and they're and they're bearing out. You know who's and who's really feeling the brunt. Most particularly, you see this in the states, but here as well. That you know they feel the brunt of what happens with COVID nineteen, and uh, and but the, but our response to that has been so fantastic. I think uh, not perfect, but pretty good, and uh, and and we got to just move that over. We got to transition that over to the other challenges that confront us right now. Not easy, but we've done it. We've shown we can do it. And, uh, you know, and I think there's a willingness to take these challenges on. 
Minister, we're taking a lot of your time. I really, I really appreciate it. Any, any final words for our, for our national? Keep doing what you do. Um, be proud of what you do. And let's lower some emissions. All right, sir. Thank, thank you very, very much for your time. We really appreciate it. We hope. Uh, I realize it's a little later in the day there in Newfoundland. We hope we can get out and enjoy some of that uh, some of that sunshine. Well, the construction guys are still at it, so you know it's not. I guess it's not that late. They're still pouring that concrete right across from my from my house in within <laughs> microphone range. So my apologies to the audience, but anyway, well, before I, it goes I on, didn't hear life goes I on. I apologize if you heard my daughter playing the piano upstairs or the dog barking oh, that's in the a, background. That's a lovely thing. Both lovely things. Yeah. Take care of yourself. Thank you so much, Ed. Good to Thank see you. you.